Good morning, Good morning Siak. Siak. We are Mandy and John. We just want to welcome you to South Edmonton Alliance Church Online. This is interesting times that we live in, and we just want to welcome you to our uh, online church service where we can all gather together and uh, worship the Lord together. Uh, this is an interesting platform that we can use to share uh, our services with your friends and your family. So make sure you share a link with them. Uh, hopefully this is a more accessible way to share service with people that may not walk through the door of our church. First of all, I want to update you on COVID-19. You've probably heard tons of things about COVID-19, but I uh, just want to let you know that our church has deferred gatherings until well into stage three. And that has been the decision made uh, with the guidance from the uh, Medical Officer of Health. Uh, I just want to re recommend that you guys continue to be vigilant in your day-to-day -day life and make sure that we practice good social distancing so that we can put this virus behind us and that we can uh, eventually gather as a church together physically. Uh, the thing I want to talk to you about <laughs> that I almost forgot is that we as SIAC uh, also want to support those that may be lonely, uh, those that are not connected to our church. Through our siac.ca website, there are forms that you can fill out. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to Mandy or myself or talk to someone on the chat here in, in the YouTube uh, chat, please feel free to do so. We want you to feel like you're connected and we are very willing to chat with you and to meet with you uh, in, uh, not in person, I guess, but we just want to make you feel supported. So let us know because uh, this can be a tough time for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Um, so three exciting things to let you guys know about. Uh, Pastor Brianna has been working hard. Uh, th so the first thing it would be family devotions every Thursdays at 10 a.m. on Zoom. If that time does not work for you, please let us know on the com in the comment section uh, to your right. Uh, next up is the youth online gathering, uh, also on Thursdays, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, they will be doing some games, a time of sharing, um, just like hanging out. It's on uh, Zoom, I think, right? Zoom, yeah. yeah. Uh, thirdly would be VBS coming up also as summer is approaching. Did I say that already? Mm -hmm. For grades one to six. Um, so different activities, crafts, um, time of sharing as well uh, from Pastor Brianna. Uh, she is wrapping up the details about uh, VBS. So we will let you know about registration and all the other details in the coming weeks. I think she's also looking for volunteers, oh. so please let Iris, let, let Mandy or I know, or please let Pastor Brianna know how uh, you'd like to help. And this would be a great opportunity to get connected with uh, church staff and also with the youth of our church. Let's build into the next generation together. Finally, I just want to announce that church has moved to a different way of giving. It's a privilege and joy for Christians to give uh, of their time, of their money. The Church Center app is one way you can give to our church and also through the SIAC website. So these are different ways that you can look into supporting our church and also the ministries that we do to support our overseas missions and uh, whatnot. In this time, let's pray together for uh, the offering and um, yeah, let's bless this time. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have provided everything to us. Uh, our breath, our life, you sustain us. Uh, you are our shepherd and our friend. And we are so um, overjoyed with everything that you have given us so that we can uh, continue to give back to you and to give to our community. Lord, you teach us in, um, in your word that uh, the early church, the disciples shared everything with one another and they um, grew strong in community and they shared food together. And Father, we just want to um, be like that. We just want to uh, give back a portion of our time and the money back to you for your kingdom purposes. For we know that um, you say it's blessed for a man to, to give. And we just want to um, be obedient in that. And we trust that you will do your work with the money that we do offer to you in any way, shape or form. Uh, Father, we, it is our joy to, to give back to you. And uh, we just love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. Church, we, uh, we miss you guys. We hope to see you next week. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Good morning, South Edmonton Alliance Church. It's so awesome to be together as a family to worship together. Just want to welcome you wherever you're joining us, um, which it would be online. Um, but it's such a blessing to be able to worship regardless. And I know it looks a little bit different and it feels different, but you know what? That's okay. Um, today, let's just try to treat it as devotions time. Um, so we're just going to throw up a couple of passages for each song and it'll just be your time to just meditate, pray through these passages, and we'll just be playing music through it and worshiping through it. And so hopefully that can just help you, you know, maybe change things up a little bit, um, but ultimately just be able to meditate on his word. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory King above all kings, this is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations? Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun and all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free and oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me sing worthy worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me, all that you've done for me, oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. So just as we continue in worship, whether you're listening to this on the go or watching it live or watching it with the kids in the background, whatever it may be, 
um, I just hope that it's actually a chance for us all to be able to actually step into the presence of God. Um, we're here as a church to contemplate his glory. And if our hearts are not ready to do that yet, that's totally okay. Um, so I just thought it would be a, a good time to just do a little heart check. And so in a moment, just as I play, um, this will just be time for, for you. Um, and so just as you pray, rather than asking yourself, try directing it to God and ask him what your heart looks like today. Just one sentence. It doesn't have to be super complicated. It doesn't have to take forever to step into God's presence. It just takes one moment of turning your eyes towards him. For some of you, it may feel like a really long minute. And for some of you, it may feel like it's not enough time because you have so much on your heart. But either way, the Lord wants to meet with you today. He wants to meet you where you are. He truly, truly does. So I'm just going to play just for about a minute or so. And this time is for you um, just to reflect, to pray. And you could just, if we can just stop for even one minute to give God one minute. Father God, you just know the depths of our hearts way more than we do. So God, during this time, may we just, just lean on you, not on what we think we understand. Lord, we just want to say that we trust in you when it's just super scary. Lord, lead our hearts right now because our hearts can be led so astray and so far from you. Lord, we just turn our eyes back to you. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word. That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you All about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. King, 
of endless worth No one could express how much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart And I'm coming back to heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm so reload for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm coming back to the heart of and it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you All about you, Jesus It's all about you Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Cause you have been so, so kind. your foe, still your love far from me, as you have been, you have been so, so good to me, when I found no worth, you paid it all for me, you have been so, so kind. Oh, it 
chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming and never-ending reckless love of God. Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, you're coming after me, and oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you Give yourself away and oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love God yeah. so, so kind to me. You have been so, so good to me. You have been so, so kind to me. so, so good to me. You have been so, so kind to me. You have been so, so So good to me. You have been so, so kind to me. You have been so, so kind to me. Luke 16, 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. 
In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Just to set the scene, Jesus has been walking the streets, doing a lot of teaching and preaching, and large crowds have been gathered around him. And at this point, they're all just wanting to hear him speak. He's been having meals with Pharisees and tax collectors too, and it seems like no matter where Jesus goes, there are some Pharisees that are there, waiting and just ready to ridicule Jesus to go against anything and whatever Jesus would say. And this parable that we see is right in the middle of the conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. And Jesus just finished telling the parable of the shrewd manager, where he's teaching about how to responsibly use your money and how to use it wisely. I often wondered why Jesus spoke about money so much and why he taught about money so much, why he preached about money so much. But after studying the book of Luke, I just realized that a lot of it is because he's confronting these Pharisees over and over and over. And it's known that they loved money just way too much. And right before he tells us of this parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus says something that's really important that'll help kind of give us context. And he says this to the Pharisees. He says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate one or love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him and said to them, Jesus said this in response. He said, You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And that's a really confrontational Jesus. He's straight up calling them out. And right after this rebuke, this is where we find today's parable. In a continued response to the Pharisees. So in this parable, right away we see two characters. We see the rich man and Lazarus. So first picture this rich guy, right? He's described as wearing the color purple and fine linen. And you may not think that purple is really luxurious, but in his day, purple dye was really, really expensive to make. So purple clothing was very expensive. So he was going to wear purple everything because purple is expensive. So it'd be like if you saw a man now and he's wearing a Tom Ford suit and a Gucci belt and LV shoes and an Hermes bag. Purple dye is like these luxury brand names. And that's what dressing in purple and fine linen looks like. He's rich and he wants to show that off as well. It's not like he's Steve Jobs just trying to wear blue jeans and a turtleneck. He wants to show it off. And it goes on to say that he lived every day in luxury, meaning that he ate expensive food, he had expensive cars, expensive house, he had all these things that were expensive around him. And every day he was spending major cash. So, you know, imagine this rich man wearing nice clothes in his big house and has this amazing yard and in front of his beautiful gate to keep people out, in front of his 
huge mansion, there's a poor man laying there. And we meet this poor man. And you probably wouldn't want a mental picture of him. Because the way that Jesus describes him is pretty grotesque. So first of all, this poor man, he's hungry, right? He wants to eat what falls from the rich man's table, it says. And when you're that hungry, someone else's scraps starts looking good to eat. Food that's fallen on the floor, no longer does it matter if it's spit on the floor for five seconds or not. You'll eat anything. And that's the state of what Lazarus is in right now. And second, he describes this poor man as covered in sores. And I did this Google image search of covered in sores, and it was pretty disgusting. You don't, you don't want to look at that kind of skin. But then it gets worse. These dogs come by, and they lick those sores. And that's just the image, like, I don't, I don't even want, and I can't even imagine. You know, imagine a man like that. Imagine Lazarus at your doorstep. Would you have pity on him? Or would you call the cops and get him out of there? As you're thinking about Lazarus, there's other interesting things about him. Him, his character, is found in a parable. And he is the only person that's given a name in a parable. All other parables just say a Samaritan man or a servant or a master or a farmer. These generic kind of labels, but Lazarus is given the name. So why is this significant? You know, if you look at the meaning of the name Lazarus, it means God helps or the one who God helps. And we see clearly that this is the case with Lazarus in this parable. He's covered in sores, longs for food, he's hungry, but people around him don't help him. And he ends up dying. And it's only when he dies, when he reaches heaven, God sends his angels, sends Abraham, to comfort him, to help him. The name Lazarus. Lazarus, another reason why it's significant is that even though this is a parable, you know, it's fiction, it's a fictional story, Jesus, in reality, has a friend named Lazarus. And in this parable... Jesus is foreshadowing something that he'll do in the future. He'll resurrect the real Lazarus. And by giving this poor man a name, we'll see how there's these interesting parale parallels between this story and what happens in reality. But we'll get, that, get to that in a bit later. Okay. So now we both meet, meet Lazarus and we meet the rich man. And we see their lives and their situation you know, one has it really good, another is suffering, but all of a sudden they both die and we get to see their lives and what it's like after death. And in an instant, everything is reversed. The man who is in agony no longer is Lazarus from his sores or being hungry, but the rich man is in agony. He says that he's in agony from the fire. The man who is excluded outside the gate is not Lazarus at the gate of the rich man's house, but it's the rich man who's at the gates of, outside of the gates of heaven, excluded. The man who's begging is no longer Lazarus asking for food, but is this rich man begging and pleading for Abraham to send Lazarus to cool his tongue, some water, he's burning. But Lazarus's hands are tied. He can't go from where he is in heaven to the rich man in hell. There's a great chasm that is set in place. If you ever had the question, could you go from hell to heaven or heaven to hell? This parable suggests that there's a great chasm in between and you cannot go from one place to the other. And this rich man pleads for help. But Lazarus can't help him. What, what went wrong for this rich man? Back when uh, my wife and I were dating, we went floating down the river with a friend, bunch of friends in Calgary, and 
we're going down the river in, a, in about five or so rafts, and we always wanted to chill together. And so we tied a rope together so that all of our rafts were in one big blob. Right? So we're going down. And it's so fun because you just relax, you're kicking it back, and you have your friends beside you in each raft, and you're having snacks, and you can talk to whoever. But I remember as we were going down the river, it was getting a bit harder to steer with all of our rafts tied up together. And me and Emily were in one raft in the front, and all the other rafts were behind us. So all of a sudden, I see this super thick branch, right? And our raft hits it. And then once our raft hits it, all the other rafts behind us starts pushing against the stick, the branch. So the branch stabs our raft super hard. And then all of a sudden, poof, the raft blows up and shrivels into nothing. And then I freaked out immediately. I jumped out of the raft into someone else's raft because I saw like, I can't float on this one. And then, as I was in the other raft, one of my friends yelled at me and he said, dude, Emily's over there holding all your stuff in the raft that you were just in. And I look back and I see Emily holding a backpack full of you know, all our food and our snacks and our wallet and keys, cell phones and stuff. And then the raft in the other hand, trying to hold it all together so that nothing just floats away. I panicked so hard and all I cared about in that moment was myself and I didn't realize there were people around me who needed help as well. And I think a lot of times in our lives we live this way. We're coasting, focused on how much we can enjoy ourselves and we only look out for ourselves and rarely do we look outside of ourselves and the lives of others. How often do we empathize? How often do we look after the well-being of others? As Jesus tells this parable, I think we need to take a deeper look beneath the surface, behind wealth and poverty. It wasn't just that this man was rich. It was about how he treated the needy man that was just outside his gate. Now, this rich man was lavish. He was covered in the most expensive purple clothing, right? Yet Lazarus was covered in bloody sores. The rich man had the privilege of eating whatever he wanted, whatever his heart desired. And yet Lazarus is right there at his gate, hungry. And this rich man neglected Lazarus. He was too selfish to give generously to Lazarus. This rich man was too self-absorbed to help him, too concentrated on his own pleasures too con concentrated on purple clothing, that helping someone else became just a real inconvenience and he saw no profit in helping Lazarus. What's the point, right? When you care only about your own pleasure, your ego, your luxury, your comfort, others don't really matter anymore. When you worship money, you start to disdain the poor. And we see it all too often with big companies who care only about their profit margins. And you could see how their employees are being treated. And often they're not getting paid much and the conditions are bad so that those profit margins can get bigger, right? When you love money, you neglect the well-being of the poor because how would caring for them make you any money, right? There's no profit in caring for the poor man. And Jesus told this parable right after we are told that the Pharisees, they were lovers of money. And he says, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in God's sight. These Pharisees, they probably thought they were good people. And they justified themselves. And I think we do this too. A lot of the times we think, you know, I'm a good person. I'm generally nice to people. I'm a contributing member to society. I help my family, my friends. I haven't done anything that bad lately. I don't really sin compared to others and all that. But the truth is that we are all sinners in need of Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. 
We need the cross daily on an hourly basis. We cannot justify ourselves. And God knows our heart. There's this video of uh, a rap, the rapper Drake on YouTube where he's telling the interviewer how much you know, every article of clothing costs. And he talks about his clothes and he's like, well, this, this custom Brioni jacket, 11, Tom Ford turtleneck, two racks, Tom Ford crocodile shoes, 14, Richard Meal watch, 750. And I think when you're that rich, it's just, it's just too long to say thousand because each thing was 11,000, 14,000, 750,000. Right? And I was so blown away by the watch. You know, how could that watch be worth $750,000, right? And I looked at this blogger who was writing about this brand and why the watches are so expensive. And he says that it's not that the materials or the craftsmanship is worth that much but it's what the watch represents. It's a status symbol, it's luxury, it's a rare piece that only certain few can have. It's not really about telling time. It's about the feeling you get owning it and how in comparison to others, it makes you better. You know, it's not just a Timex and it's not even a Rolex. And most people wouldn't know what it is because it's so rare. But you would know in your heart. And just like Jesus says there, God knows your heart. He knows what you're after. You don't need to try to justify yourself. And then he says, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in God's sight. You know, these status symbols, these things that make you just go, wow, that's crazy. That's expensive. That's beautiful. That's amazing when they become less about the function of what it is and more about the status, this is an abomination in God's sight. All these things that are exalted among men, he hates that because that's worship. It becomes worship. Right? Do you remember when Jesus was describing Lazarus? When he was disgusting these Pharisees with this description of who Lazarus was and what he was like. He had sores on his skin, dogs licking him. He's laying on the street. And Jesus was describing this abomination to these rich people, something that was disgusting. Why else would Jesus be so graphic and give, him, give them this mental image of Lazarus? How do rich people feel when they see dirty, diseased skin, uh, with, where there's a man laying on the street. If you're worshiping money and you care all about these status things and beautiful things, how disgusted would you feel seeing a scene like that, seeing Lazarus like that? This rich man was all about himself, justifying himself, and he worshiped everything that this sinful world would worship. And that, in contrast, is an abomination to God. It's not the sores and the dirty skin and you know, laying on the street. That's not disgusting to God. What's disgusting to God is when people worship these man-made things. And we find this rich man in hell, not because he's rich, but it's about how and what he worships and how he treats others. If it was just because it was rich, because he was rich, Abraham would be in hell too, but he's not. Abraham was a rich man as well, but we find Abraham in heaven. This is where the rich man went wrong. And as he realizes this, he gets this idea. Because he thinks about his brothers, and he doesn't want them to be in the same agony and be in the same place. But at this rate, his brothers will be in the same place. So he, he tells Lazarus to come warn his brothers, to come back to life and warn his brothers. But Abraham knows that his brothers won't listen. Even if Lazarus comes back from the dead and warns them, they'll not repent. And Abraham says, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, 
They will not be convinced if even someone comes from the dead. And the crazy thing is that later on, a dead man actually does get resurrected. And that man, man is actually named Lazarus. When Jesus is telling this parable, when he told it, he was foreshadowing a miracle that he was actually going to perform. It's not a coincidence that he's telling this parable of a man named Lazarus. And then he actually raises a man named Lazarus from the dead. In this parable, it says that even a, if a dead man is raised to life, they will not listen. They will not repent. So what happens when Jesus actually does raise Lazarus from the dead? How do the Pharisees respond? Do they listen? Do they repent? They actually get so angry after the miracle that they plot to kill Jesus. A miracle wasn't an amazing thing that caused them to worship, that caused them to repent, to listen, to change their mind. It was seen as a threat to the Pharisees' power. If Jesus can do these amazing miracles, everyone would follow him and listen to him and listen to Jesus. And why would they go to the Pharisees? Why would they follow the Pharisees? Why would they listen to the Pharisees? Jesus became a threat. And you would think that after Jesus performed this miracle, just like how this rich man suggested, if someone comes back from the dead, people will listen. You would think that that would be true, but it's not what happened. Instead, they set out to kill Jesus. They couldn't have Jesus going around resurrecting people and gaining followers because that means that they would lose followers. They would lose authority. They would lose power. Jesus was their competition. And that competition was a threat to the Pharisees' lifestyle. They wanted power. They wanted influence. They wanted money. And they couldn't have Jesus coming in and taking that away. The Pharisees would lose everything they worked so hard for. Abraham was right. Even if someone from the dead comes and warns them, they will not repent. And even if Jesus himself was raised from the dead, these Pharisees didn't listen. Jesus died and rose again, yet these Pharisees hated him. This parable really, truly reveals the darkness and the ugliness that can be behind wealth. It shows the heart of someone who is twisted and corrupted by the love of money. The self-absorption, the ego, the obsession with power, and the unwillingness to help those who are hurting. When God sees someone hurting like Lazarus, he desires to comfort them, to love him, to feed him. That's, that's why the name Lazarus is what it is. The one who God helps. However, when this rich man sees someone like Lazarus, he ignores him. In his heart, he's saying, if he can beg, he can go get a job. He thinks Lazarus is gross. He wants to avoid his sores. He wants to avoid Lazarus' smell. The rich man doesn't believe that Lazarus deserves his help. If you're honest with yourself, when you read this passage, do you feel sorry for the rich man? Or do you feel sorry for Lazarus? I say this because privileged people often empathize with privileged people. If you are rich, you probably think it's not that fair that this rich man went to hell. You know, he didn't do anything that bad, right? He didn't kill anyone, he didn't steal or lie. However, if you're, if you're less fortunate, you could empathize with, with Lazarus instead. And if you've experienced oppression, you can understand the pain for those who are hurting, like him. And in this parable, it's clear to see the heart of God and who he helps. I hope that and I pray that we can align ourselves to God's heart and who he helps people like Lazarus. And really hear me, this is not a guilt trip where it's just I'm saying, go help poor people type of message. 
This is more of what does our heart look like in regards to the poor? Is it, is it disgust? Is it neglect? What, what does our heart look like in regards to the rich? Is it exaltation? Is it worship? And now is not the time to justify ourselves like these Pharisees, because God knows our heart. You know? But it is time to listen to Moses, to the prophets, to listen and to repent.
defense my righteousness oh god how i need you my one my one defense you're my righteousness oh god how i need you how we need you Oh God, how I need you. 